What is Syria and what's Iran going to do? We don't know. Syria has said that uh, their response will come as a surprise to Israel. Uh, their response could be a direct attack of some sort, or it could be a, a symmetrical response. We don't know. And of course, we all know that uh, Israel was baiting Syria. Syria knows it. But um, there comes a point when they bomb your territory on the outskirts of your capital that you have to, uh, you have to respond. Syria has been uh, extremely conservative in terms of responding to the Western powers that are funneling enormous numbers of foreign mercenaries and weapons into Syria to battle the Syrian army. But what the mainstream media is not telling you is that Assad is winning. Uh, in fact, the narrative, and they have different narratives, and they change the narrative frequently when it, one doesn't work or the other. But the latest narrative began less than two weeks ago by a U.N. official. He said, uh, you know, that Syria is falling apart. Syria is coming undone. And this is the, the uh, reason now. Uh, why they're attacking. They're saying, well, Syria is going to release its chemical weapons to Hezbollah, et cetera, et cetera. This is bogus. The Syrian people support their country and Assad. They, more than anyone, because they see it on a daily basis, they know that they're being attacked by foreigners, for, by foreign powers and that uh, their arch enemy Israel is deeply involved in it. Now, what the Syrians have done, uh, they made a strategic change about three months ago. They had been fighting in every village throughout the country, and they decided that they would withdraw to certain areas that were the most important and not immediately contest every village. Um, because that was giving too much of the strategic control, the strategic initiative to their enemies. Some people mistook that as a retreat, no, just the opposite. They have consistently chewed up the so-called rebels, which are foreign mercenaries. But with all the all money, there's no shortage from the Gulf Cooperative States, which are the West Puppet and Israel and NATO to keep sending more and more poor Arabs in, offering them a fifty, a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go and fight um, the Syrians. In fact, in Saudi Arabia, and they, by the way, chop a lot of heads off there, uh, if you have a death sentence, you're given the option to have your head chopped off or to take an AK-47 and go fight the, um, the Syrians. Needless to say, many of the people that they're sending there are really bloodthirsty murderers, and uh, you've had just incredible crimes against humanity, against men, women, and children, and the Christians have uh, often taken uh, the brunt of it. Syria was a very peaceful country. Long-time listeners will remember I had a Eastern Orthodox priest on a few months ago when I hosted. He had just gotten back from Syria. Um, his archbishop sent him to Syria because, uh, and this is a church that I go to, because we were getting reports from people living there, or, or reports from pr parishioners around the country who have relatives there, that what they were hearing on the news media was totally wrong from what their relatives were telling them or what they had experienced themselves. So we sent some priests over. Yeah, they literally were given card block, and they said everything that we're hearing is a lie. We'll be back in just a minute. This is Lars Sterling with the Nutra Medical Report. This is Lars Sterling, and for Dr. Bill Deagle, and this is the Nutra Medical Report. Well, I'll tell you, we're we're in. Uh, 
um, very, very dangerous times. The um, very good uh, publication, Veterans Today, uh, on the Internet, and they broke the story that uh, what really happened in Sandy Hook was uh, three Mossad uh, terrorists that went in and killed uh, the 20 kindergartners and uh, the six teachers and aides. Um, and that's just absolutely almost unbelievable, but the evidence indicates that uh, the official storyline, once again, uh, doesn't make sense. It was a false flag. In any case, um, one of the latest stories that I linked on my news blog, Europe, and by the way, if you want to find it, just do Google search large sterling Europe, um, is that uh, this is an event that not only is designed to help take our guns away, but to get our attention in a certain direction. Because what's happening right now in the Middle East is as big and as important as us keeping our guns and our right to protect ourselves against tyranny. World War III is the ultimate trump card. And we very definitely are going down a war, uh, path towards the Third World War. The Russians have their largest battle fleet uh, since the Second World War assembled in the Mediterranean off of Syria. 18 warships, including some of the largest warships on Earth and most heavily armed. Um, both Russia and China have made it clear multiple times at the highest levels both civilian leadership and military leadership, that an attack on Syria and our Iran is causa bella for even the Third World War. And they've made that very clear. Pakistan has made it clear that they will defend Iran if it is subject to nuclear attack. And keep in mind, Pakistan has a large number of hydrogen bombs and the ability to deliver them. Uh, at the same time all this is going on, uh, our Japanese ally has been deliberately baiting China, uh, although that doesn't take a whole lot because the Chinese are feeling very flush with money. And um, it looks like they're, when war breaks out, there'll quickly be a Japan-China war theater uh, and probably an India-Pakistan-China war theater, as well as a Middle Eastern war theater, and God knows how many other places. We are literally staring the Third World War uh, in the face. Will it happen? Well, I believe it will. Um, sooner, probably, than later. Um, this all has been planned and orchestrated, just as the Napoleonic Wars, which were really the first global war, uh, was planned and orchestrated, and the First World War, and the Second World War. You have a very small group of criminals, the global banking cartel families, that are incredibly wealthy and profit from wars. They usually loan money to both sides, and the winner has to guarantee that uh, they'll get their money back from the loser. And this is historically factual. Now, they use war to reshape society to their benefit. And this is history, the history of the 20th century and the 19th century. Right now, there's, what, seven, eight billion people on this planet, and they think there's far too many unnecessary eaters. It's a very satanic, demonic view of humanity, too many unnecessary eaters. 
so they plan on thinning the herd, and we're the herd. Uh, and those that are left, other than their exalted highness, uh, the super elite, and their senior people, the people that the rest of the population that will be left will be a tiny fraction of what it is, and they'll be literally in a police state, a high technology police state. But that's not going to exactly play out right because we know how things are going to go down because it's in the Bible. Um, anyway, well, I, this is very scary stuff. And uh, people like Dr. Digo and myself and others that deal with this on a daily basis, and we read uh, countless articles and put things together for our listeners and viewers. Yet, uh, you know, sometimes it wears on us. I mean, this is a, uh, it's, it's a very tough thing to stare in the face. But the important thing is, this isn't Satan's world. This isn't Satan's universe. Satan is, uh, I think Dr. Deagle calls him, uh, the Lucifer. He's uh, Lucifer, who is a loser, the ultimate loser. He's a pathetic creature who uh, had an incredibly high place in heaven and threw it away because he wanted to be God. Well, nobody can be God but God. And as Christ said, he was a, a murderer and a liar uh, you know, from the beginning. So what we have to do is prepare ourselves with uh, nutraceuticals, prepare ourselves with food, water, uh, whatever we need to survive for as long as we can in terms of, you know, you, you only have so much money. But prepare yourself, but most importantly, prepare yourself spiritually. Because if you're right with God, and if God is in your heart, you won't have fear. And you might be a little anxious, some of the stuff coming, but you know, ultimately, uh, we're only here for a short time anyway. And uh, when you're a kid, you know, 10 years is like an eternity or 20 years. Uh, my mother is uh, almost 93 and uh, is in pretty bad shape. And uh, I'm sure to her probably 90-some years went by pretty fast. I think my 60-some years have gone by pretty fast. So time is short, and God is eternal. And if you go upstairs, if you go to the right place when you die, you're going to be in a very happy, very safe, very peaceful place. Um, after Armageddon, we know that Christ will return at the end of Armageddon, and things will be very peaceful. Well, we're going to take a break, and then Chris Harris will join us, and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Alexander Lord Sterling with uh, Nutramedicals nuclear expert, nuclear safety expert, Chris Harris. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hey, good evening. Thank you for having me. I guess it's a, a, an unusual occasion again. Uh, Dr. Bill had some personal business to attend to, and he left, no. uh, he left us with no adult supervision. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the kitties have the show. <laughs> Uh, okay. uh, what do you what do you what do you got uh, from Fukushima? Well, just Chris. I mean, I always do my Fukushima update, and that's uh, sometimes you and I get on get on a tangent, and we don't talk about anything Fukushima. But tonight, I guess I will uh, bring up just a couple of important items. You know, as we said a long time ago, that the Fukushima mess over there is uh, well turned into the waste generation facility, or basically uh, a bottomless well of. Uh, you know, radioactive contaminants with uh, basically uh, a, a liquid uh, runoff where there isn't any, any shutoff valve. And it's proven itself true, just as we said before, that the uh, that uh, they would run out of uh, storage capacity for liquid rad waste. Some of this is rather contaminated, very highly contaminated. It came straight out of whatever's left of the core for cooling. Uh, well, they, they have run out of room, and uh, TEPCO is proposing to take the least amount of their 
or their, their least contaminated waste that is run through their sari, which is sari is their uh, makeshift, flimsy, thrown-together, skid-mounted systems for de- decontaminating this um, glop. And uh, they're going to, they, they need to make room. They need to make room for the more radioactive waste. And, and in order to do that, they're planning a release of uh, a massive... So they're just going to dump it in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that seems to be what the, what the plan would be. And that's why I said the plan had to be. There was no other way. There would be no other alternative. You know, and I go way back then. I said, no, this is, this is, you know, first of all, this doesn't even, this is in addition to what has been leaking out of these, uh, out of this, uh, system, the flimsy makeshift system. I keep on calling it that, but it really is. I mean, let's face it. This has been, this is the, all, these are basically a bunch of skid mounted, uh, ad absorbers, um, Filtration systems, uh, tanks, all hosed together with non-permanent style fittings and hoses that have been there since, well, the first, the first, it was first put Probably in service. Probably like fire there. hoses. Well, they, well they, they, I mean, they're a little better than fire hoses. You know, that would be basically what you use in a chemical type situation, a chemical thing. But they're not hard pipe. They're not all hard piped in. They're not what I would expect to see up to code. You know, uh, we use uh, ANSI B31.7 for any kind of piping that would house uh, liquid rag waste in it. And it's got to be pretty beefy stuff. It's certainly stainless steel with supports and all kinds of things. Well, this is not all, all up to that kind of a code. I mean, there's a reason why you want that. And, uh, you know, and also it would be subject to leakage around flanges and things like that. So, we are getting um uh we're getting uh leaks and and uh, all kinds of uh, problems that it is actually causing a lot of uh, waste runoff you know right into the pacific ocean that's what we're seeing right now so this this release would be and that's the rest of some of the really nasty stuff uh what we're seeing is uh they're going to have to make room in these tanks because the only cooling method you have is you Put in clean water and it comes out contaminated. I mean, that's that's basically the the strategy for any kind of long term cooling. Because and the radi- uh, the the enriched uranium or plutonium is so hot, it has to con- continuously be cooled, right? Yeah. Now, now they now that I mean, it has cooled, you know, over over a period of the last two years and all. But it does take a long time, and it's still putting out heat, and it requires many many cubic meters of of uh, clean water or reprocessed water, but but what I'm really you know I look at that too. You know they're removing some of the particulates from the water that comes back out of you know the cooling water that comes back out. You try to capture as much as you can. A lot of it is running out uh, through leakage, but also uh, then once you remove the particles and all, then you you end up with something by what I would call and what the industry term would call sludge. You know, very radioactive sludge, and that's also building up. So, what so are, the what are we sludge, do? I mean, it, it, it's not clear. So, what, what you've got? Uh, so you, these tubes are chromium, is it? Oh well, the, well, the, well yeah, there's all kinds of corrosion products. Remember, early on, now, first of all, first of all, this the, the reprocessing system that that was first put together was put in service in August of 2011, okay? So since then, it's had a couple of typhoons, snowstorms, a uh, couple other earthquakes. This stuff is weathering poorly because it's not meant for any kind of long-term use in that in that capacity. This stuff's supposed to be stored. You know, all, all these uh, tanks and, and components need to be... Uh, they're not, they're not supposed to be subject to that kind of an environment, whether they should be indoors where, where possible, under enclosures and all, and some of it is and some of it isn't. And very so, closely it, monitored and everything, right? Well, yeah, up to the... Go ahead. Well, so uh, is, you've got the, these tubes with the enriched uranium in them, which is, are, in, in one case, uh, it's a MOX plant. It's a combination of plutonium and in, in, enriched uranium. And are the tubes themselves uh, coming apart in some cases because they, they've gotten too hot? Well, in those in, in the in the reactor cores, it's it's uh, most likely that much of that zircaloy tubes with the uranium pellets inside of it have actually melted. 
into some some state that we don't fully know what the condition of it is. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are penetrations at the bottom of the reactor where all this would probably slump to inside the reactor, not the units one, two, and three, because unit four had no fuel in the reactor. All of it was in the spent fuel pool. But, you know, if you, if you want to talk about that, there are penetrations where the control rod drive mechanisms go up through the bottom of bottom head of the reactor, and those are, you know, those, those were probably melted through, and so it, even Tepco believes that there is a, a lot of what we call corium or melted core. Now, did, on, the, on one of them, did it the actually core. go all the way through the steel and the concrete and into the ground? We, we won't know. We're not going to know only by, only by only by secondary evidence, you know, any radiation and, you know, uh, radioactive contamination, uh, would, would we know that it, it's possible that it is, that has gone deeply in or through the containment structure? That would be the, the, in, the uh, outer vessel. It's possible that some of it went through. We're not going to know that until we start really taking a, you know, an eyeball onto it, shall we say, which is yeah, but not it's, an it's too dangerous to get that close, isn't it? Right. That leads that leads to a different uh, uh, article where Unit Two, that's the one that didn't have uh, a. It had an explosion. In fact, it had two explosions. This is what best I can gather. But it, the reactor building didn't blow off like uh, Units One, Three, and Four did. And so it doesn't look like a lot went on in there. However, the indicate unit two was also indicating higher than normal or higher than the others' ele uh, elevated temperatures. You know, in in unit two, unit two something really peculiar was going on. It was more than more than a melt. And um, and of course, it's been blamed that the higher temperatures were just due to bad instruments. Which the, and you know and and. Uh, that that says a lot in itself because what would cause the instruments to go bad, you know, other than the explosion, they really they may have been really subject to high temperatures, and they probably failed due to that. Now they're trying to put uh, by remote long handled tools uh, new instruments on Unit Two, but one thing they did do is they removed the section of the floor above the torus chamber. And they're looking to see if they can find any evidence of fuel damage that way. Um, okay. I can tell you what they said, what they found when we come back. Yep. We'll be back in a few minutes, guys. This is Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling, and Chris Harris. Nutra Medical Report. While we were off the air, we were we were talking. I've had some expertise in the aviation industry, and you know, uh, we, we, when you you when they design these uh, reactors, uh, you really want to plan for not a hundred year uh, danger, but a five hundred year danger. But uh, yeah, then again, it's you, you, you have this kind of the same problem that you have with airplanes. Yes, we could design a plane to be extremely tough and uh, just about fail safe, uh, but the problem is uh, you would never get off the ground because weight is a very big consideration. Uh, but if a plane crashes, you've got 300 or so people may die. If one of these uh, nuclear uh, reactors crash, you know, it's yeah, millions, if not hundreds of millions of deaths that you may be looking at. You have to always consider what the, what the overall effects on a population, you know, could be. You know, when, when you're examining the cost of the prevention of such an incident, you know, I mean, sad to say, a plane crashes and you know you're going to kill 100 people or so or more, you know, these days with some of the big ones, but you know, this is but something like a, a big industrial accident like this, or the BP, uh, you know, disaster that's still ongoing down there too, is affecting the lives of many people. Well, it's still affecting the weather here. globally. Uh, the to me, and, and I think you you pretty much have said this, uh, but I, I put it in a little bit cruder terms. But to me, this is a giant wound on the face of planet Earth. And it's oozing, uh, call it whatever you want, pus, blood, whatever.
about other, but it's a giant wound and it's not going to heal itself and it's going to be there probably long after us and everybody listening to this show has uh, turned to dust. And that that's scary. And it's scary that uh, we have nuclear power plants all over the world, all over the United States. And I'm not totally convinced that uh, we're prepared for some of these scenarios. Uh, I mean, I think if we get into a third world war scenario where uh, we have an enemy pop uh, a couple of EMP weapons high in the atmosphere and take out the grid, the electric grid in North America, I'm not sure what the hell we'd do. Just uh, even if they don't hit us with any nukes, the, the fact that after a month or two, we're going to run out of uh, fuel. We're not going to be able to keep these things going, and uh, you know, keep them cool. And we last thing on earth we need is a uh, hundred Chernobyl's uh, or a hundred Fukushima's all over the United States. No, we, we should. We, we sure don't. And also, you know, when um, yeah, you brought up a good point about uh, you know any kind of an attack on, but that you know that always. It always goes back to the stability of the grid, and we're finding that that's not as much as it, not as beefy as we, we would like it to be. And uh, certainly, you know, I did I did read the, that fellow, uh, I guess it was John Maloof. I read his book. Um, uh, he, he made some good points in there. I guess it was uh, similar to what we've been talking about for a while now, that the uh, the health of the grid is is, uh, is pretty much hanging by a thread a lot of times. And really, if somebody goes in and they throw some sort of an EMP device, I don't even think it's going to take that much. Energy. I really think, you know, we, we saw some massive tornadic activity going through, uh, um, you know, the Tennessee Valley, you know, a, a few years ago, and it, it just uprooted these huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, towers. Just like you know, it's like they were toys, and uh, they're always in a really tough place to put new ones in, and, and they got them back finally. But uh, you know, it, it certainly. What if that was even a little more widespread, you know, than than or or in a more uh, more densely populated kind of a, a region where there's a lot of power lines going in there? Would the the effects would have rippled outward, and automatic protections would have taken place, and it would certainly have isolated. Uh, large sections of the grid, including uh, you know nuclear plants, uh, any kind of like you know chemical plants, yeah. they need power too. They start releasing. Um, yeah, well, and and also you know it's it's what's downwind. Uh, even though the Fukushima uh, prefecture, the, the the area around Fukushima is heavily contaminated, and there's been a lot of contamination in Tokyo and so forth, they're kind of sticking out there by the ocean, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of the contamination has gone in the ocean, which is bad. But uh, <laughs> recently, I, I read an article. They they pulled some fish out of Fukushima waters, and they were over five thousand times uh, the radio was over 5,000 times the safe level. So that's probably not something you want to eat. Uh, but uh, unless you want to, you know, check out uh, rather quickly. But uh, uh, it, it, the location there, though, uh, well, I mean, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. If, if you have a, a, a Fukushima-type event and downwind is New York City or a major city, uh, it strikes me that you potentially are looking at a, a, a tenfold or a twentyfold uh, worse scenario, because uh, it's not ocean; it's 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 a massive city with millions and millions of people. But in Fukushima, I mean, on the other hand, yes, it's. It's kind of out there by the ocean, but that's a heck of a place to try to encase it. In uh, Chernobyl's case, they were able to encase everything on all sides, and uh, who knows how long it will last, but the idea is to keep it encased for tens of thousands of years till it naturally cools itself down. But it's pretty difficult to do that, considering the location in Fukushima, and plus you have six uh, reactors and seven cooling pools. Uh, yeah, that, that, that adds a bit of a dimension to the problem. And I said that, you know, quite a while ago, I said this was going to be mainly an aqueous 
uh, release and a you know and a hazard to to marine life and well to everybody's life because eventually it gets into the food chain from the plankton on up or even you know lesser than plankton lower than plankton and you know what we're seeing now I mean Dr. read a report saying that it's not the the um, going back to the to the land based contamination problem well the cows are having calves that are, have more uh, more cesium in in their bodies than than the than the parent animals. So in other words, there is a bioaccumulation effect, and kind of a concentration effect. You know, they were fed, uh, they grew up on uh, on the milk, and that uh, led to more of a. So the ca- the calves are actually becoming more contaminated than the parent. And then this is only a little over a year and a half into the, in, into the nightmare. So what happens, you know, five more years down the road? Um, well, uh, either 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 we uh, either uh, we we learn either we adapt or or we take our you know neutral meds or whatever 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 it is we do whatever precaution is. The fact is that that is happening, and we have to. We got to, you know, we got to face up to it and deal with it and say, you know, this is reality now, and uh, well, there, there's, there's a different risk. You know, people yeah. still want to take risk, and, and you know, there, there's all kinds of risky behaviors that we do, and we're just knowing that eating beef from that part of the world may introduce a different risk, and we go on with it, you know, and try to do the best we can. I would imagine because I don't, I can't really fathom anything else we can be doing. Um, yeah, I, I, when I look at the Middle East, uh, you know, uh, uh, the nuclear facilities that Israel has alone, uh, the, the Daimona uh, power plant and uh, weapons facility, it, if they are hit by Syrian and our Iranian missiles, uh, particularly if they use something like fuel air explosive technology uh, with pinpoint precision where you get uh, a tactical nuclear uh, PSI pounds per square inch uh, reading or, or any number of different ways. I mean, you they literally could create a nightmare that would kill most Israelis and would, in fact, of course, go well beyond the Israeli border. Uh, and the same thing if uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, power plant is hit. Uh, literally, it would be killing millions of people uh, in China. Uh, it's a crazy, crazy world. Well, I, I did hear, uh, I guess earlier this week, you know, Alexander Bachman did, did bring on uh, that, that report that I was trying to verify about, uh, you know, the Iranian uh, facility being hit. Uh, by something, you know. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah that's sort of a bold move. I'm not looking for radiation at that point. I'm looking for it because some of that steel has been irradiated. So that's well, that, but it's still possible. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Dr. Deagle will be back tomorrow. Uh, get right with God, folks. God bless. Thanks, Chris.